Hi guys, thanks for joining me. If you haven't already watched the video before this one, I suggest you go back and do that. This is a continuation of God works through his servants. We were taking a look at Moses' life, his call and response from God, how God has been pursuing an active relationship with Moses and how God was able to use this servant to complete his will. We compared Moses' calling to the seven realities of God. We started with the first three in the last part, and now we're moving on to the last four, and then beyond that to take a look at a couple more of his servants. So here we go. So God reveals what he is about to do, and that revelation becomes an invitation to join him. So the fourth reality exhibited to Moses is that God spoke to reveal himself, his purpose, and his ways. Exodus 3, 2 through 8 says there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses answered, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. And we see God speaking again in Numbers 12, 6 through 8, when he says, When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face. What an honor. So God's invitation to Moses for him to work with him led Moses into a crisis of belief, which is the fifth reality of God. And that crisis required faith and action on Moses' part. From a whole bunch of references in Exodus, we see Moses making these statements, this crisis of belief to God. He says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? <laughs> what if they do not listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Lord, I have never been eloquent, Moses says, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And Moses finally says, Oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it. So Moses' crisis calls for faith and action. Hebrews speaks to this in chapter 11, verse 24 through 29. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Back to Exodus chapter 4, the Lord had said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. So we see the sixth reality of God here. Moses had to make major adjustments in his life to join God in what he was doing. The author says many texts throughout Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy illustrate how God revealed himself to Moses. As Moses obeyed God, God accomplished through Moses what Moses could not do. Here's one example from where Moses and the people see God as their deliverer. These excerpts are found in Exodus chapter 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it to dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground a wall of water on their right and a wall of water on their left. The Egyptians pursued them. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and the horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians laying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they put their trust in him and his servant Moses. 
The author has a few questions for us. What did God reveal about himself, his purposes, and his ways? What did Moses have trouble believing in about God? How would you summarize Moses' faith as it was described in Hebrews 11? What adjustments did Moses have to make? And how do you think Moses must have felt when God delivered the Israelites through him? Again, the author gives us some of these answers. God came and talked to Moses about his will. God wanted Moses to go into Egypt so he could deliver the Israelites through him. God revealed to Moses his holiness, his mercy, his power, his name, his purpose, specifically to keep his promise to Abraham and give Israel the promised land, and really many other things not described in the scriptures above. Moses offered many objections, as we heard. He questioned whether or not God could do it through him, whether the Israelites would even believe that God appeared to him, and whether he was capable of speaking eloquently enough to get the job done. In each case, God was really doubting God more than himself. He faced the crisis of belief. Is God really able to do what he says? Yet his faith in Hebrews is described as a model of sacrifice and trust in the Almighty God. Once God let Moses know what he was about to do, that revelation became Moses' invitation to join him. Moses made the necessary adjustments to reorient his life to God. Moses had to come to the place where he believed that God would do everything that he said he could do. Then he had to leave his job and his in-laws and move to Egypt. And only after making those adjustments was he in a position where he could obey God. That didn't mean he was going to do something all by himself for God. It meant that he was going to be where God was working so God could do what he purposed to do in the first place. Moses was a servant who was moldable and remained at God's disposal to be used as God chose. God accomplished his purposes through him. When God does a God-sized work through our lives we will definitely be humbled before him. Moses must have felt humility and unworthiness to be used in such a way, such a significant way. Moses obeyed and did everything God instructed. Then God accomplished through Moses all he intended. Every step of obedience brought Moses and Israel to a greater knowledge of God. The next section starts with what can an ordinary person do? The author says, one of the wonderful scriptures that has helped me to this point is, Elijah was a man just like us. Remember Elijah? We talked about him a couple lessons ago. He also prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain in the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. But Elijah was just an ordinary man like we are ordinary. He prayed, and God responded. When God healed a crippled beggar through Peter, he and John were called before the Sanhedrin to give an account of their actions. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter spoke boldly. And notice the response of the religious leaders in Acts. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. All of the people we see in scripture are ordinary people. It's their relationship with God and the activity of God that makes them extraordinary. Did you hear that statement that the religious leaders noticed that Peter and John must have been with Jesus? Anyone who will take time to join into an intimate relationship with God can see God do extraordinary things through their life. And this is on par with how exemplifying that relationship with God in our own lives shows other people that God is in our lives and is working through us. Surely they'll say, that's not that person. You're not capable of doing that. It must be God. A testimony simply by example. An interesting question from the author here. Could God work in extraordinary ways through your life to accomplish significant things for his kingdom? We might say, well, I'm not Elijah. We might say, I'm not David or John or Moses. But you don't have to be. God doesn't want us to be these biblical characters. God wants us to be us. And he wants us to let him do through us whatever it is he wants to do. If we ever believe that nothing significant can happen through us, then that really says a lot about what we believe about God's capabilities rather than our own. That's kind of a harsh reality of our belief. That crisis of belief. The truth is, he can do anything he wants. He has all the power to take an ordinary person and do extraordinary things with them. God's standards are different from man's. The author says, don't be surprised that God's standards of excellence are different from man. How long was the public ministry of John the Baptist? Maybe six months. But what was Jesus' estimate of John's life? Luke 7, 28 says, I tell you, among these born of women, there is no greater than John. None greater. He had six months wholly yielded to God, but the Son of God put that stamp of approval on his life. We can't measure our life by the world's standards. Don't do it. Many denominations are doing it. Many pastors are doing it. Staff leaders. 
many churches in general are doing it. By the world standards, a person or a church may look pretty good, but in God's sight could be utterly detestable. Similarly, a person or church could be doing the right thing, could be wholly yielded to God and very pleasing to him, but completely insignificant in the world's eyes. Could a pastor, the author says, who fully serves where God put him in a small rural community be pleasing to the Lord? Sure, if that's where God put him, God will look for and reward faithfulness, whether the person has been given responsibility for little or for much. An ordinary person is who God is most likely to use. Paul said that God deliberately seeks out the weak things and despised things because it is from them that he receives the greatest glory. Then everyone will know that only God could have done it, not because they're talented, not because they have many gifts, not because they're good speakers, but because God has worked extraordinary miracles through them. If we feel weak, limited, ordinary, then we are the best material through which God can work. So here are our summary statements. God reveals what he is about to do. That revelation becomes an invitation to join him. I can't stay the way I am and go with God. He is able to do anything he pleases with one ordinary person fully consecrated to him. And God's standards of excellence are different from man's. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for another look at the many ways that you can use ordinary people to serve your extraordinary purposes. God, thank you for revealing to us through scripture the moldable characters whom you've deemed worthy and necessary, who you chose out of all the people on earth to do your work through. Lord, thank you for giving us these real-life examples of weak, limited, doubtful people we know that we are similar. But Father, thank you for recognizing us. Thank you for seeing us for all of our potential. Thank you for seeing the potential to do your work through our limitability. Thank you for believing in us when we don't believe in ourselves. Or worse, when we don't believe in you. Lord, thank you for your patience with us as we try to listen for that still small voice. Thank you as we try to evaluate the paths of which you would have for us. And Lord, we ask that you just give us the strength to be able to make those adjustments after we get through that crisis of belief, that we are able to turn our lives over to you, Lord, and just simply trust you. But no matter where you take us, no matter where we are called to go, we will go, and we will go with confidence, knowing that at the other end is you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for being the great big God you are. Thank you for allowing us to be part of that great big Godness. In his holy name I pray. Amen. <laughs>